everyone. This is Hannah Cavanagh speaking, and welcome to yet another amazing episode of CUNY Uncut, where we talk about anything and everything, uncensored, unedited, and uncut. Today, I have an amazing woman on the show um, who's a mainstay in the Australian burlesque scene, um, a director of the Australian Burlesque Museum, as well as a contender of competitions such as uh, Queen of Burlesque. And she's currently pursuing her doctorate in theater studies at the CUNY Grad Center. I'd love to give a warm welcome to Alyssa Kitt. How are you doing, Alyssa? I'm so well. It's so good to be here. And I always I always have to say, who let me in anywhere uncensored? <laughs> Not wise. No, absolutely. I'm no, very excited. No, super wise. This is probably the wisest decision I've ever made. <laughs> anyway, it's such a pleasure to have you on the show. I've been, this has been, guys, you don't even know. This has been like six-ish weeks in the making. This has been a long time coming. Um, because today we're going to be talking about... Um, body and sex positivity and how your work in burlesque like influences all those things and also how people can be more in tune with their bodies um, and with their sexual needs. So the first question that I have for you is how did you get into the world of burlesque and like what inspired you to kind of delve deeper into it? Absolutely. Well, I think it's really, really wonderful talking about body positivity because since my career uh, in burlesque took off, um, when I was 18 years old, we've really tracked and trained, trained uh, really tracked how body positivity has grown and proliferated, not just through different scenes, um, not just through different life paths like around the world, but um, through social media. We're oh, literally cool. tracking and changing how body positivity, how sex positivity has changed during burlesque, but in the past 20 years. So, um, how did I get into burlesque? Was that the first question? Yeah, <laughs> this is always this is always a really really fun one, and it's also uh, a really good one to kind of preface everything. I was a stripper. That oh, was, cool! That was my first foray into burlesque. Was was as a strip striptease artist in strip clubs. So, um, when I was the stripping age in Australia is eighteen, as is the legal drinking age. Mm -hmm. um, I always wanted to be a stripper, just always. Um, so the first, when I turned 18, I got a job in a strip club and that was, that was that. This was making like these theatrical worlds. I rocked up in an evening gown and gloves and that's what I thought strippers wore. That's so cool because I feel like, yeah, there's always like the common stereotype of like, strippers being more like raunchy in regards to dress and it's cool that like you switch things up in like an evening gown and gloves it shows that there really is different styles to like the world of burlesque and of striptease but I'm, I'm curious like what was your family's response to all this when well, you first I'll, got into it well the family response is a is a different one as well and and going going to this is 2007 when I started stripping so that's quite a little while ago and the terminology burlesque wasn't really as used then. Mm. Um, it was early in the neo burlesque revival in Australia. Um, so there were maybe under 50 burlesque artists. I mean, there could have been under 30 burlesque artists. Uh, at the time, the neo burlesque revival in America had taken off in the early 90s. So cool. the, the kind of the time frames, the terminologies that we're using, because stripping and burlesque have these different class connotations as well. So they're, they're, they're like discussions that are quite prevalent now, but they definitely weren't at the time. So for listeners that may not be aware, like what's the clear, is there, what's the clear demarcation between striptease and burlesque in regards to how it's viewed culturally? Oh, there. Oh, this is always. This is the question that every single bell, any any interview that I've done over my career, but every um kind of marker of what is this? What is this? We always we love definitions. Yeah. We love definitions. Um, firstly, burlesque artists are strippers. We are quite literally doing a literal act of taking something off mm -hmm. for the purposes of sexual tease. That is our role mm -hmm. is to elicit a desirous response, whether that's with our eyes, with our body, with whether we want you to whoop and scream. And strippers do this as well. They do this for direct money. Hmm. They're different. 
they 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 have many different many differences. I think a lot of people used to have a little giggle about you know oh um, the difference between a stripper and a burlesque artist is the size of your bag. You know a, a burlesque artist will have you know a suitcase in order to take take an, a very extravagant outfit off, and then a stripper will have something very small that they could hold in their hands. But um, but I think this is a great false falsity because I have a number of amazing strippers, stripper showgirl friends who have the most ridiculously over the top feature showgirl shows um, and costumes as well that do very much rock up with suitcases. And likewise, you're not a practicing burlesque artist in New York City unless you can whack at least a couple costumes in a, in a bag and mm-hmm. try traips around the subway. No, that's one thing I really admired about burlesque is like the level of work that went into it because actually your show at the Slipper Room that I went to a few weeks ago was actually that was the first burlesque show I ever went to and it was like, yeah, I know. <laughs> so it was like I wanted to kind of go show support but also kind of dealt like see what burlesque was all about because, you know, there's all these like common misconceptions that are out there and I wanted to really like go and see what it was all about but I was just amazed at the level of artistry because, you know, like you said, the cost costume changes, the props, the dancing, like it really is like an art form. But I think one thing I was still, I was like thinking about is like, wow, just like the level of confidence it takes to like bear yourself to all these people, like most of which strangers, right? So I'm wondering like what your relationship with your body was like prior to getting into burlesque and striptease and how that's kind of evolved over time, the Mm. more that you've done that. Mm, absolutely. Um, so welcome to the magical world of theatrical striptease. Thank um, you. Happy to be here. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, my show at the Slipper Room, I did uh, my act Icarus Fallen, which uh, which I'd recently come back from competing mm-hmm. for Queen of Burlesque at, in Las Vegas at the Burlesque Hall of Fame. Um, and actually, very funnily, so I'm quite a small person by nature. I'm five foot two uh, by nature, by physicality. And uh, when I do Icarus, I tower over seven foot because of my headdress is um is huge. That I have headdress these... is so amazing. Yes. Like... Uh, yeah, it's designed by um, Diego Montoya, who actually just won an Emmy, uh, an Emmy for costume design and makes a lot of stuff for Sasha Velour. But these oh, cool. towering horns um, and, and I, I am Icarus who has flown too close to the sun and my wings have melted and I've dropped off the face of the earth and crashed in. Um, and it's a metaphor for trying to reach perfectionism and never being good enough. Mm. So coming to bear your body in front of people and saying, well, this this is not what binds me anymore. I'm freeing myself from this need for your approval, but also crushing that doubt in myself. And that's that's the journey that all of us are on is for self-acceptance. So um, coming into stripping at 18 years of age is was I'm I'm 33 now and so my my relationship with my body even though I was naked on stage was very very different I was acting confident and that's one of the biggest parts about coming to burlesque is it's it's a growth of confidence and it's a liberation of what has struck that confidence out of us to begin with so I um I was coming out of growing up uh, in classical dance, in classical music, and not feeling like I had the ideal body. Um, a lot of people don't know this about me, but I actually have gained and lost between 20 to 30 kilograms quite a number of times in my life. And when I came to stripping and burlesque, I was in quite a larger body. Mm-hmm. Um, so I did not fit what the the ideal classical ballerina body was and was always made to feel as though I wasn't a good dancer. I uh, couldn't move the way that other ballerinas could and I was mm-hmm. told no point. Um, and so when I came to stripping and burlesque, I didn't have to be a certain way. I mean, in, in stripping, you, you do need to, the because of the power structures that be in, in hiring and firing in strip clubs, like you, they want you to be of a certain body type, mm-hmm. um, which I described to at certain points in my career. But burlesque was so free of that. 
It was That's so amazing. free of that. You, you're not just seeing bodies, but you're so close to them that you can see the ripple of cellulite. Mm. You, we're here to celebrate the jiggle. And that's everything that makes us human. It's also everything that makes us vulnerable because yes. these layers of um, of how we come to have our relationship with our body through media, through women's magazines, through television, through film, which was a lot of the time the only representation of m- closer to naked bodies that we would see outside of our familial structures or beaches or whatnot. Um, so, yeah... That's um, how my relationship with my body has changed over time is, is, a, is a complex question because I've gone through all of these iterations of my body and how I want to work with my body and use my body. Uh, and I do consider my body to be somewhat of a costume as well. We, we manipulate it hmm. in burlesque. Uh, I consider feminizing my body to be part of the costume. So as we're building ourselves into historical looking uh, iterations of glamour, we're reconstructing the corset. We're reconfiguring what it means to, to, to puff a chest out with padding or like building into these different notions of beauty over the past uh, eras. So, and yeah. finding a lot of power in those. No, I feel, yeah, I feel like um, getting in tune with your body is always, like, it's an ever-evolving thing. It's not a journey that just ends, like, as long as we're alive and, as long as we're alive and doing our thing, like, that's always going to be something that um, we have to navigate. But um, you're, you do bring up a good point, though, about going through, like, re like, iterations of it. And, you know, there's moments where, you know, I'll feel super confident in my body and, like, bearing myself. And then other times where... I may not as much, but I feel like a lot of times that has to do with patriarchal ideas as to how women should express themselves and how women should be. Um, And, you know, I feel like it factors into weight and body shape in regards to the fact that, like, women are encouraged to take up as little space as possible, both in both in conversation, but also physically. But I I, think I think I think I always want to like, like drop in and just say it's not just women. It's uh, completely gender inclusive. And, and, you know, when when uh, I I always like to be as diverse and inclusive as possible, and which is important when we're talking about breaking down patriarchal structures, because patriarchy affects all of us. No, you're so right. Thank you for clarifying that. That that definitely is worth noting for sure. Um, but I was going to say as well, um, I one thing I notice in which this manifests is also um, through sex and through pleasure. Um, one thing that I've noticed is that um, a lot of times when it comes to when it comes to situations like that, I'm talking more so um, in like heterosexual ways because that's like the only experience I can really relate to. But I feel like it really expands beyond that. Um, there's like instances of not feeling seen. You're just there for the man's pleasure, right? And a lot of times, um, women and non-binary people are kind of tossed to the side in regards to that. So I feel like body positivity in relation to sexual desire, um, there's very much an ebb and flow in regards to that relationship. So I'm wondering, like, how do you think we can reconstruct those notions and make it so that sex and pleasure in relation to body positivity um, is a positive experience for everybody? Mm, absolutely. It comes down to boiling down to what makes you feel good, what makes you feel strong, what makes you feel safe. Uh, and for me, body positivity and sex positivity begins with the self. Mm. So having an innate understanding about what makes you tick, what makes you turned on, And this is to do with confidence as well. Like I'm going to talk about like, you know, being confidently turned on is being turned on by yourself and being able to walk down the street and being like, yeah, I know I look good because I feel good. (laughs) And I actually don't care what you think because it's not for your approval. I am for my own approval. And when you start to take up space as yourself and owning your diversity, owning your difference, that is when other people do see whatever form you are in walking down owning space that's making making space for change and that's that's to do with like sex politics as well um 
uh, going down talking about open relationships and open like sexual practices i we have a lot to learn from the bdsm community mm-hmm. consent communication yeah is so fundamental to to all sexual relationship all relationships really but to talking openly about what people are allowed to do to your body in sexual situations is what the most empowering thing in the entire world and people literally writing that down for themselves saying i want this i want this in order for me to feel good in order for me to have an orgasm to feel absolute elatory pleasure in my body mm-hmm. i need this this and this and if someone doesn't respect me enough to respect these but respect this conversation that does need to happen before there cannot be unclear signals when it comes to sexual practices i think these having having these conversations i mean flirting is always you know the flows of desire but but really being able to communicate what what makes us feel good for sure and i think a part of it is also being being encouraged to explore what we like in the first place right because i feel like a lot of times i don't know how i don't know what sex ed is like in australia but here in the states we I had mean... a giraffe <laughs> we had a giraffe telling us about sex ed i That's think so, so funny i mean i mean <laughs> I think I think it's changed a lot. I mean, I I'm not in high school now, so I don't know what kind of conversation. But I I hope I hope that it's getting better yeah. everywhere. Um, but actually, I didn't have sex ed until senior year of high school, which is crazy because that at that point a lot of people are a lot of students are active sexually by that mm, point. But absolutely, pleasure is totally left out the conversation. Yes. It's all about contraception and like STI prevention but in that ne- there's never that talk of like checking in and like exploring our bodies and figuring out what we like and what we don't like I mean thankfully my mom was like super supportive and like sexual liberation and things like that and like she even would like um she'd like recommend like sex toys and stuff to figure out like what I liked what I didn't like but mm. I feel like a lot of times that's very rare that that happens mm. um but you're right, a lot of it does kind of start with the self. But mm. um, I'm wondering, like, what like what kind of led you down this point of realization? I guess burlesque is part of it, right? But you said that that was more, like, acting, some somewhat, like, acting, right? So is there any other parts of your life that kind of made you come to that conclusion in regards to kind of the importance of pleasure and, like, knowing what you like, that sort of thing? It's it's very interesting having this conversation talking about how we grow up with pleasure, what our relationship with is coming to our own pleasure. And that's not just sexuality. We're talking about the body. We're talking about all these different forms of pleasure. Yeah. So it can be what is pleasurable to touch. Hmm. And we're very tactile creatures in burlesque. We guide gaze through showing what is beautiful yeah we touch it when we feel beautiful Mm -hmm. we share beauty and that makes us feel good yeah and when we run our hands over various different parts of the body that have sexual connotations it's because these pleasure centers have extra firepower and so therefore they are naughty and that, you're thinking sexual things, just looking at me, going near my nipples. Yeah. But, and that's naughty too. But, but why is it naughty? That's what How I was did we going come, to say. <laughs> how did we come to this? You know, through tr- tracking these different eras of burlesque, uh, in the 1930s, you were not legally allowed to touch your body on stage. Really? No. So artists would frame the body. Oh. They would pretend to be touching nipples while holding their hands quite far away from the body. Mm-hmm. And so we and and similarly to the costume pieces, this is how these evolved. You would have different costume pieces to hide naughtier areas. So you might have a piece of applique over uh, the front of a panel skirt. And a panel skirt is a very a long piece of chiffon that covers the the groin region, the G string area, the mm-hmm. inner the inner flaps. Everything's covered. So but it's also ironic because it's sparkly. 
and it's drawing <laughs> attention. And it might have little like dripping, dangling crystals that yeah. do naughty things that look pleasurable to the eye, but are also pleasurable to the body underneath. <laughs> So looking at how how burlesque has evolved throughout history is a really interesting manner of, of experimenting, seeing what's, what's naughty at different points. Um, go back to your question for me, because I already forgot what it was. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I may have forgotten as well. Um, oh, yeah. So how now I'm remembering. So how I'm wondering, aside from burlesque, like how... How did you grow to realize that sex isn't filthy, it's not dirty, it's a perfectly healthy form of intimacy? By and telling myself I was a dirty girl. And really? Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I got into the BDSM world when I was 18 as well. Um, oh, and it's I kind didn't of know that. Feel, hey, <laughs> there's a hey. Um, I performed a lot in fetish clubs. I have a lot of fetish style routines, but mm-hmm. I performed in fetish clubs and doing rope bondage performances, doing pain performances. Wow. Um, they are things that are wrapped in shame. You're turned on by pain, by extreme physical pain. There's something wrong with you, right? Hmm. If that is pleasurable to me, why is that wrong? And it, yes, it has a lot to do with detendrilling, like why we've come to these relationships with our body, like why we're turned on by what we're turned on, how we map that pleasure. But that is also our activism of pleasure. So for me, being owning the fact, like, yeah, I am turned on by this. Yes, I am a dirty girl. Yes, I like this A, B, C, and this is why. Mm-hmm. Respect this. That's really been a huge part of my self-acceptance, but also sharing those messages with others. Yeah, for sure. Sh- I mean, that's a that's a great point that you brought up. I think I think when you're already when you're already there, it's like it's easy to claim it, right? But there's so many, um, there's so many like people that I know, women and non-binary people that feel a sense of shame when it comes to sex. When it's brought up, they don't. It's like the uh, there's awkward giggles in the room. No one wants to talk about it, right? Absolutely. So for people that and so for people that are really struggling with like owning their bodies, owning sexual pleasure, because you know, like we said before, it's all intertwined. Like, what kind of advice would you? give to people that are really struggling with that that need like some kind of way to tap into that somehow play dress ups Hmm. role play think about just different iterations of yourself and imagining yourself in different circumstances and there are safe ways to do that you know reading literature watching porn writing little dirty short stories for yourself Hmm. thinking about what how you might feel beautiful being gazed by someone else and how you might like to be touched by that person. And there's so much stigma around around different kinds of role-playing and different kinds of, of playing dress-ups of different kinds of um, sexualization. Like, I love to feminise myself. That makes me feel beautiful. Mm. But men like to be certain men like to be feminized as well the feminization of self in androgynous bodies in non non gender conforming bodies how how is that negotiated both visually socially acceptably and how is that negotiated privately as well hmm. so removing these strains these these levels of shame which nothing brings me more joy in the entire world than to see people proudly walking through the street wearing what makes them feel sexy, what makes them feel good, whether that is a set of high heels on someone who would traditionally look very masculine or a dress or just however makes you feel powerful, thinking about what your power item is. I mean, I I consider the lipstick to be my weapon. Mm. I consider a stiletto to be one of my weapons because being told that sexualizing myself in in the era that I grew up in, you know, riot girl feminism, I was made, I I felt a little bit like I, I couldn't call myself a feminist being a stripper. But I learnt feminism in the strip clubs. Why? Because I learnt how to have a strong voice. 
I learned how to stand up for myself and use it and say, you know what, this isn't acceptable and this isn't an acceptable way to treat me mm. or my fellow strippers. And burlesque artists truly take that vanguard and say, this is us owning our space, not acceptable outside. No, that's amazing. I, there's also like, um, there's one part... I mean, all of it really resonated with me, but especially the idea of fantasy self, because for the longest time, I mean, up until college, actually, I was really ashamed of my body and I would wear baggy clothes to hide because I just, well, part of it was that I was self-conscious about, I was self, it was just something small. I was self-conscious about my boobs. I thought they were too big and I'd wear baggy stuff to hide my body because I was so ashamed. But then, you know, the I, during COVID, when I was, you know, everyone was stuck at home, I felt like I kept ruminating in this idea of a fantasy self. Like, what mm -hmm. kind of woman would I want to be? What kind of Hannah would I want to be? Yes. And channeling that. Yes. And I feel like I finally got, I mean, I, you know, it's still, confidence is always, like I said, a lifelong progress, like process of like gaining it, but also maintaining it. But I feel like I really hit major strides when I constructed this idea of fantasy self and like strived for that. So Absolutely. that really stuck with me. Absolutely. Yeah. And that 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 was burlesque for me. Hmm. I imagined Alyssa Kit. Kit is my stage name. Alyssa Hanley is my real name, uh, which they're combined now. Alyssa Kit Hanley is my name so I can be Dr. Kit one day. Hey. <laughs> hey. Um, and but Constructing Alyssa Kit mm -hmm. was taking the best parts of my identity, things that I loved about myself, and grandizing them, exaggerating them, making them larger than life. My mm -hmm. life goal was to have hair the size of my hips. My life goal was to take up space with my body through these different different confident poses right you know I loved having the big hair I loved having big hips and I loved making them as exaggerated as possible and so Alyssa Kitt was always who I wanted to be times yeah. 200 um no for sure and it seems like you've already a achieved that to some degree and it's still like and it's only going to get better from here so listen I this is such an incredible I would I could talk with you forever but we we're gonna like wrap things up but I before we go I just want to give you the opportunity so what cool projects are you working on why don't you tell the listeners what's coming up right oh, now oh gosh well we, we 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 barely we even got on to talking about like my research um so yeah I'm, I'm in my going into my third year of my PhD here at CUNY um and so I've been working on some really fun research projects. I'm about to go to the American Society for Theatre Research uh, conference awesome. coming up in November. And I'm going to be presenting on um, new media dramaturgies of burlesque. So how the practices of erotic erotics evolved under COVID mm -hmm. and what kind of art people were making under these different confines. But also what that means implication wise for how we ingest erotics. Um, so that's one little thing. Yeah. And the other little <laughs> thing that I'm really excited about is I'm I'm going to be in Seattle uh, in November as a key presenter for BurleyCon, which right. is the biggest burlesque conference in the world. So I'm going to be teaching about how we work with archives mm -hmm. and uh, how we destabilize space and spectatorship. Awesome. Well, exciting stuff in the works. So you heard it here, folks. Feel free to be on the lookout for that. And yeah, thank you so much for being on the show, Alyssa, to talk about body and sex positivity with me. This was such an amazing conversation. My yeah. absolute pleasure. My pleasure, All pleasure, right. pleasure, pleasure, pleasure. <laughs> All right. So this is CUNY Uncut, where we talk about anything and everything. Uncensored, unedited, and uncut. Thanks for tuning in. Bye, everybody. Bye.